Good morning to you. Good and, morning. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to conduct an interview about your um, future endeavors in California politics. Mm -hmm. um, for those who might not know you, mm -hmm. uh, who is Gail McLaughlin? Ah, okay. Well, thank you, Mansoor, for having me, uh, interviewing me in this process. My name is Gail McLaughlin, and I'm the former two-term mayor of Richmond, California. I served 12 and a half years in the Richmond City Council, eight of those years as the elected mayor of Richmond. And I served all my 12 and a half years and ran and won all my campaigns, all four of them, without a penny of corporate money. And that's because of an organization that we have formed in Richmond. And I'm a co-founder of the Richmond Progressive Alliance, otherwise known as the RPA. The RPA is an inclusive, diverse, year-round, corporate-free, progressive organization. We came together because we had had enough. The entire city council before the RPA was in Chevron's hands. They were either purchased by Chevron or intimidated by the oil giant because we have this major Chevron oil refinery in our city. So we decided to become the leaders we were waiting for. And we came together based on our progressive values, regardless of party affiliation or no party affiliation. And we said, we were going to build a local movement to gain local political power. And we were going to run um, local candidates without any corporate money. And I was the first elected corporate free council member and went on to be mayor and now we have five corporate free council members out of seven. That's a super majority on the Richmond City Council. So we've really made some massive changes, you know, in the composition of the council, but also in terms of what we have accomplished for the people, which is really the purpose of changing your council and getting into office and building a local movement. So there were many, many changes and I could share some of them with you. Um, at this point, like for example, what we did was pass a minimum wage to $15 an hour. We also passed the first new rent control law in California in 30 years. We also reduced crime dramatically. Now before the RPA, Richmond was known as a very high crime city. but. During uh, the last decade or so, while well, RPA was working and I was in office and we led this remarkable transformation, we reduced crime really phenomenally, including a 75% reduction in homicide. Now we did this by addressing the root causes of crime, giving opportunities, quelling the violence before it started by having outreach teams reach out to the youth involved in you know, troublesome activity and let's many other activities. Let's get to those in a little bit, but I want to mm -hmm. know what is this old dinosaur uh, <laughs> Robert Barron Chevron uh -huh. did that caused you guys mm. to do an uprising and upsurge to run for the um, council and for the mayor? Uh -huh. Well, first of all, Chevron has been in Richmond since Richmond got got in municipalized as a city. Just like El Segundo here in ah, Southern California. That's right, yes. And it has polluted our community over those hundred years. And it has caused incidents, so-called accidents, but really based on um, neglect of their refinery and, and not spending the money to replace pipes and such. So we've had major uh, incidents where our community has suffered the impact we also have uh, had them not paying their fair share of taxes. So this major refinery was getting away with murder, literally, in our city. We have among the highest rates of asthma in the state and um, respiratory illnesses and heart disease. And so it became clear to us we had to do something. And we had to do it by standing up to Chevron. And as a result of doing that, we were able to um, get uh, First of all, they weren't paying their fair share of taxes either. So we were able to get a hundred million, over a hundred million dollars in additional city taxes from Chevron. Uh, let me stop mm -hmm. you over, mm -hmm. over there. I'm sorry to do this things. No, uh, no. But, uh, okay, so with this 
Trump administration and previous mm -hmm. administration, they all have said, if you tax our corporations, they're going to get up and leave the country. <laughs> now, you making a statement which is absolutely contradictory to what the federal government is saying. Mm -hmm. and, and then I understand that Chevron cannot just pack up its bag right. and go. Right, so right. could you explain the contradiction and, and mm -hmm. how you guys accomplish that? Right. So first of all, Chevron is going nowhere in Richmond or in other cities. They have their major infrastructure in place. You know, in Richmond, they have an ideal uh, spot on the bay for you know receiving the oil coming from the, the ships. They're not going to pull up and leave. And also, there has not been a new major oil refinery in the country since the 1970s because communities don't want a refinery in their city, and right so they pollute they harm they cause risk so um, we always say if if that threat comes up oh Chevron will leave if you require them to pay too much in taxes or if you limit their pollution or if you push back on them we say they're not going anywhere and the truth is they aren't going anywhere we pushed back and got them to pay 114 million dollars in additional city taxes we also limited their pollution and we also beat them on the electoral field they are so frightened of the progressive movement because we stand for the people not for the corporations that they spent millions to try and defeat us in 2014 they spent three and a half million dollars to try and defeat me and two other progressives and we all won and all the chevron funded candidates lost and that's because we have this organization this movement building effort where people trust us we build relationships with the community they get it that you know this corporation needs to be regulated so they supported us and um, they continue to support us and that's that's something that any community can do it can organize it could build those relationships with the community it could get whatever big corporation is in their community trying to buy or already having bought their city councils we say if we could do it in richmond under the money might of Chevron, it could be done anywhere. And Bernie Sanders agrees with us. Bernie came to Richmond in 2014 because he saw our RPA model making so much progress. And he said, what they're doing in Richmond is what needs to be done everywhere. Build a multi-issue, multi-racial alliance on the issues and address problems from the grassroots at their root cause. And so I was honored to have his endorsement for my 2014 campaign. I had the privilege of introducing him at a town hall in Richmond. And uh, today I'm going to all these Our Revolution groups spreading my message of saying, build progressive alliances. And I have received thus far 32 endorsements from local Our Revolution chapters. Those are the organizations that Bernie Sanders launched. So we continue that momentum. So uh, now you're running for Lieutenant Governor of California. Mm -hmm. Okay, so before we get that, mm -hmm. um, when you became mayor, were you serving public at all before that? Were mm -hmm. you council mm -hmm. member? What uh -huh. did you do before right, right. becoming a mayor? So before I ran for mayor, I just served two years on the city council. I realized that with all the Chevron funded council members, you know, surrounding me and sitting at the dais with me, that I would have a stronger voice if I ran for mayor. So after just two years, I was in the middle of my first term as a council member. I took on the incumbent mayor and I beat her and then was reelected um, in 2010. Prior to being on the city council, um, I was an activist. I have been an activist my whole adult life for social justice, anti-war, anti-sexism, anti-racism, um, you know, and, and held various jobs, everything from an educator to working for nonprofits and um, just really putting my emphasis on my volunteer activism. Great. So that's what I wanted to hear because mm -hmm. um, it's really a daunting task to run for an office if you don't have some sort of background. Right, right. And especially if you're an activist, mm -hmm. um, you know, you really have to be involved with society, knowing the issues mm -hmm. in order to 
create a coalition that can beat Chevron. That's right. Um, so now you're running for gubernatorial, uh, lieutenant uh, governor of California. Correct. Okay, so tell, tell us what was the impetus of that? Okay, great, great question. So it became clear to us after we had made so many changes in Richmond, and I mentioned you know, the changes of pushing back in Chevron and the minimum wage and the rent control, but also things like you know, just lifting up the community with um, things like community choice energy so that now our residents and businesses have their electricity come to them f with cleaner, greener, and cheaper sources of energy. So, you know, there were many, many, you know, helping our public schools, pushing back against charter schools, um, stopping local jail expansion and putting in place reentry programs. So when people came back from prison, they had opportunities rather than ending up, you know, in a recidivist mode and ending up back in prison. So people saw the changes we made. They saw that we had um, now a, a super majority in the city council after this was in November 2016. So they wanted to know how we did it. And eventually, I was giving presentations, sharing our RPA model, and eventually it became clear to me and, and others in the RPA that if we ran a statewide candidacy, we would have a larger stage and a louder megaphone for carrying this message of building from the local, you know, and, and making it clear that political power uh, can be in the hands of people. And so I decided to take on this race for lieutenant governor. And it has two wings, really. The first wing of the campaign is encouraging local progressive alliance building. And so far, we have had about seven new progressive alliances emerge in California, modeled after the RPA, from San Diego Progressive Alliance to San Francisco Progressive Alliance, all the way up the North Coast, South Bay San Jose, um, South Bay LA. So lots of uh, people are getting it, that they have to organize at the local level, run those candidates without corporate money. And so that's the one wing of the campaign, very, very important. The other wing, of course, is getting me elected as lieutenant governor, because as lieutenant governor, I'll keep the organizing going. I'll help network all the progressive alliances and the, our revolution groups and all the other progressive groups, the socialist groups and the Green Party locals. So many of them have endorsed me, and I'm so honored to have their endorsement. And I want to keep working shoulder to shoulder with all these groups, network together so we have statewide power, the power of mobilized people. And with that mobilization, we will be able to accomplish our statewide issues. We'll put the pressure on the legislature to approve single-payer Medicare for all, free college, banning fracking. Um, there are a few tax policies, tax of the 1% that I'm putting forward. One is a progressive millionaire's tax. Another is an oil extraction tax. We don't want any more oil extraction, but what is happening now should come um, to the, should come by way of taxation to the people of California. So we're the only major oil producing state in the nation that doesn't tax oil extraction. And if we tax it high enough and get that high rate of taxation to go up further each year, we will be able to get tax money and still um, put the pressure on turning away from fossil fuel extraction. And whatever tax money we get should go into solarizing the whole state. We also need to um, put a statewide public bank into place so that we can prioritize truly affordable housing and infrastructure repair and other social needs in our state. E explain that a little bit in mm -hmm. details too, because mm -hmm. it's a new concept for sure. a lot of people they haven't heard of public banking. Right, yes. So the big banks, I think we all know the big private banks have been responsible for this housing crisis, the whole foreclosure crisis that happened um, you know, a few years back was just outrageous and caused so much pain and is still causing pain for so many uh, communities. In Richmond, we, we 
championed a foreclosure prevention program called the Eminent Domain Program, where we were seeking to acquire underwater mortgages from the big banks to reduce the principal, all the while keeping the homeowner in the home and allowing uh, an, an affordable mortgage to be put back in the hands of the homeowner. Now, if we had had a public bank that wasn't out for making profit, like the private banks are, we wouldn't have fallen into this um, foreclosure crisis and these profit-making endeavors that don't think of the impact on the homeowner and the impact on communities. So a public bank is put, um, puts into effect the purpose of serving the public good, the common good, whereas uh, the private bank is into that short-term profit. And so what you end up doing is saving money by investing money in a public bank. City taxes, state taxes put into a public bank will bring about the less, uh, a more positive impact for the community because the cities and the state will not have to pay interest on loans and bonds that they take out from big banks. They also will not have the um, uh, the constant um, debt to the banks that we see building up in cities and the state. So the whole idea is to put it into place, just like North Dakota has, a statewide public bank. They've had a public bank for decades, and they have served their state so well by it. I think it's over 100, am I right? Over 100? Years. Over, is it over 100 years? I believe so. There we go. So they have had it for a long time. Yes. And we in California, we have such a disparity of wealth. We have the highest rate of poverty than any other state in the whole country. We need to start putting the public good before the private profit of big banks and corporations. That's really the core of our problem. As long as we keep getting this wealth disparity with the wealthy getting more money and the poor, you know, getting more poor and greater in numbers and people ending up on the streets homeless, we're not going to be able to, to build the kind of community and democracy that, that our country claims to be for. We have to put into place what is really needed, and that's the kind of um, ability to spiral upward for every, every family, every individual. Right now we see way too many people spiraling downward. And then of course we have the immigration issues. Richmond is a sanctuary city, and now our state is a sanctuary state. However, I don't see it being implemented. We need to really implement and stand up to ICE, stand up to the Trump administration, organize. Um, you know, in Latin America, they get out with pots and pans and bang on, on them and, and when, when there's evil happening. And we should mobilize and, and go to the ICE centers and, and get people making a lot of noise to say, we're not going to stand for this. The USA, California, is a place for everyone, and we should welcome everyone who's paying um, paying taxes, immigrants pay taxes, and playing a, a, a role, a, con a contribution to our society as our wonderful immigrant community does.